Hey everybody, welcome back. We are uh, now turning to um, a few aphorisms from Nietzsche's work, The Gay Science. Um, the uh, aphoristic style is, uh, as you've probably noticed, a bit, a bit different. Um, they're usually shorter and uh, self-contained. Um, you know, there's kind of a, an abandonment of, a, of an attempt to, you know, lay out an argument and, and prove it. It's just sort of a somewhat fast, creative, um, you know, style of presentation wherein a, a thought is uh, conveyed in a basically a fragmentary form. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's um, a, a tradition of, of aphoristic writing. Um, you know, they, they sort of come as sayings, uh, maxims, maybe. You know, Nietzsche, um, Nietzsche is a, a wonderful writer, and he sort of gets uh, maximal effect out of, out of the aphorism. Um, you know, oftentimes it's as though you are entering into a thought late and leaving early, um, sort of a, like a postmodern storytelling. Uh, it, uh, it's meant to, it's meant to, the way that Nietzsche handles them, it's um, meant to provoke you to, to think um, and, and, and perhaps to actually enjoy uh, what you're reading as a, maybe a little bit of a puzzle that you have to uh, unpack. Maybe there's some of that always to um, good writing. Um, not always, but 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 oftentimes. Uh, nevertheless, we are uh, going to look at uh, three aphorisms with this video. I, I think I asked you to read four, but we're going to look at aphorism um, 125, 190, and 341. Um, so saying that, let's go ahead and take a look at aphorism um, 125. You'll find it on page 224 of your reader. Um, I'm going to read a bit, comment, read a bit more, comment, so on and so forth. Okay, aphorism 125, the madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours? ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, asked one. Did he lose his way like a child, asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, emigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried. I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. I'll pause there for a second. Now, this is um, perhaps one of, if not the most um, famous uh, philosophical declarations regarding the death of God, and something that, you know, is... is uh, closely associated with, um, with Nietzsche. And usually the way that people talk about the death of God or perhaps, you know, claiming uh, Nietzsche was an atheist, um, it's, it's, not, it's not really the best way to think about it. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, never takes up an argument that deals with the existence of God. It's basically a non-issue for him. Um, you know, it's, it's not as though Nietzsche is making a case that God doesn't exist or that he used to exist and now he doesn't exist. That is uh, unhelpful and a bit puerile. What Nietzsche here is dealing with are the historic, sociological and cultural implications um, for a world, for a society in which God is no longer relevant. And 
what he is doing is he's going to demonstrate or attempt to demonstrate how it is that this isn't something that uh, we can fix. This is just something that's happened. And there's, you know, lots of good reasons, uh, or at least um, whether or not they're good reasons, they're, they're, they are um, sound <laughs> reasons um, why this is the case. And what it is uh, perhaps that we have to do now in response uh, you know, to this, to this debt. You'll notice that the people that he's addressing right off the bat, they're not Christians, they're, they're not Buddhists, they're not, um, they're, they're not, they're not um, any particular uh, religious group or spiritual group. Um, you know, they, they're, they're, they're people who don't believe that God exists. Right, and so they're 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 laughing at this madman. This madman comes in to you know uh, the town center uh, marketplace, um, and what he does is he has he has this lantern lit and he's 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 searching for God, right? And so there's some there's some allusion um, here to the um, ancient cynic Diogenes, who it said would you know, uh, do something similar, but he would go into town looking for uh, an honest man, and then he would, you know, obviously he wouldn't be able to find one, so he'd, you know, dash out his uh, lantern uh, in disgust. Um, but but Nietzsche here, uh, using, you know, using that similar imagery, has, has the madman, whoever that is, looking for God. And so all the atheists um, laugh at him. They're like, oh, oh, is God hiding? Like, why would you, why are you looking for God? That's ridiculous. And what he says in response isn't like, he doesn't offer some proof for God's existence. Again, that's, that's not the point. What he says is, um, he says, we killed him. We did it. All of us. Not the atheists. The atheists didn't do it. It wasn't the scientists. It wasn't the philosophers. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't the religious. We we did it. Society did it. Right. Um, and the reasons for that is just an honest look at how people live their lives and what it is that they turn to for answers to orient themselves. What it is that they find. What they place and find value in. Um, you know, something like in a world in which we trust our, our engineers and our scientists and our doctors to provide us with particular services, and our understanding of it isn't that it's miraculous and supernatural that we can take a pill and that we can feel better or undertake a surgery or that, you know, giant metal planes can, you know, fly across the world. Um, think, think of all the operations in which we're involved in, you know, like when operations, I mean like, you know, the, the various functions, uh, electronic and mechanical, um, just the day-to-day -day affairs. And we just have understandings and explanations for those things that are basically natural understandings and explanations for those things. That these are the products of uh, human ingenuity, experimentation, um, you know, a, a, a rational way of, of organizing uh, labor, <laughs> usually. Um, and that all of the old convictions that allowed for people to find God at the center of community life and around which everything, you know, everything was was organized in accord with with God or certain principles of religious life um, that gave everything a particular place in society and accorded it a particular value. That 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 world's gone. That today, if you looked around um, and you looked at a Christian, a non-Christian, uh, a Hindu or a Muslim, um, an agnostic, um, whoever saying that they believe whatever they believe, um, they all participate in the economy, same economy. 
they all go to Starbucks. Uh, they all order their stuff online. Um, they all get in the same cars. That for all the stuff that actually counts, and for all the stuff that's actually real, for all the things that require our time, our energy, our imagination, and our money, we're all the same. That we have given ourselves over to a different way of life. And some people still hold on to these old ideas and, you know, perhaps very fiercely, perhaps very piously, right? And then people take this other view that's sort of against that view um, that says, you know, that, that's, that's basically ridiculous and that's an outmoded way of thinking and believing. And it is, right? However, what Nietzsche comes along and says that either of these extremes are a denial of what's really going on and historically has gone on. And it's something like, the gods were never real. They were always products of the imagination, but they were part of a mythic view of the world in which the world was still enchanted and demanded of us a certain type of comportment and a certain type of behavior. It gave things a certain level of authority or secretity that allowed things to um, be holy, it, it, it elicited from us or demanded of us a sense of awe about some things and not about other things. And then that world is gone. It's been disenchanted uh, because of particular scientific understandings, because of how society has become organized and how we you know, practice our day-to-day -day lives and the various explanations that we have. And so to be holding on to something that's gone or to have another position in which somehow you have to prove that not only is it gone, that it never was, that these are more ideological positions that in no way understand or at least don't seem to want to understand not only how things were, right, but also the cost of losing it. Nietzsche is not trying to turn uh, the wheel of time back. It's not as though we are somehow going to bring the gods back. And Nietzsche, that's, that's not what Nietzsche wants. But he definitely wants the possibility of some sort of um, creative, uh, mythical relationship uh, with the world. And that's perhaps whatever is lingering of a romantic strain in his thought. Now, some people argue that that's just sort of an early Nietzsche aspect and it gets away from him. But I think that there's still something to that, that he does, he does feel that we are, you know, not in touch with our, with our instincts and our intuition. And this plays out also in our you know, relationship just with the world generally, um, you know, that, that we can in a, in a poetic and a creative way, um, we can perhaps re-enchant the world, not with the naive, not the naivete in which we're actually expecting that we, that we actually really believe in gods or that, they'll, that the gods will come back. That just doesn't make any sense. But um, there's a way of seeing the world, a way of seeing ourselves, a way of seeing the world, and a way of explaining it that perhaps can make use of, um, of the myth. But let's go ahead and look at the rest of the sapphires. <clears throat> um, and if it wasn't clear... It's our participation in the modern world that has killed God. That, that's, that's probably the, the main takeaway, that we have these disenchanted explanations that everybody accepts. It's just how it is. That's how we actually spend our time, our energy. That's what we actually do with our lives. That none of that indicates that, that, that God exists, exists, that God is a meaningful signifier of anything in the world anymore. It doesn't mean that those beliefs aren't powerful to people. It doesn't mean that people jealously hold on to those things. But Nietzsche is just saying, you look no different than all these people. And you people on this end, you look no different than these people. That this is just, this is a, this is a world in which the gods are gone, right? We've killed them. We did it. All of us. Intentions don't really matter in, in that regard. Um, he says... But how did we do this? 
How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, continually backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. So, you know, this is this is kind of what's at stake in late modernity, or maybe people want to call it post-modernity, that when we no longer have a sort of foundation that that is the thing which upon which we can ground our knowledge our, our truth around which our our society can organize itself you know we can try to replace it with with reason we can try to replace it with just abstract you know principles of justice or something like that um, that aren't connected to the divine but you know what Nietzsche sees is that um, that's a that's that's nothingness. That, that that doesn't that it doesn't work. That you know once you've <laughs> once you've pulled back the curtain and you've seen that's nothing there, you can't really like just replace the curtain um, with something else and be like, oh well, this is obviously going to be superior and it's going to work out so much better. Um, how has modernity looked? You know what are we <laughs> are we are we engaging in, you know, better political discourse? Are we, uh, are we, are we treating other people in society uh, better? Um, you know, <laughs> are we treating the environment better? You know, and you could you could be very selective, and you could cherry pick, and you can say, well, here, you know, this is better, and this is better, and this is better. Um, but I think that for Nietzsche, it's a, it's both a fundamental. Um, and then also perhaps a, you know, super structural comment and that we're, we're really dealing with the problem of once, once God is dead, so, so to speak, um, there's no way to really orient ourselves towards a, a true shared sense of, um, foundational knowledge, but also towards like meaning or purpose, uh, individually or collectively. Right, unless unless we of course just all embrace a particular ideology, right, and that has its problems um, as well. But saying that, he goes on to say, "How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world has has yet owned has bled to death under our eyes. Who will wipe the, this blood off of us? What water is there for us?" To clean ourselves what festivals of atonement what sacred games shall we have to invent is not the greatness of this deed too great for us must we ourselves not become God simply to appear worthy of it there has never been a greater deed and whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed he will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment Nietzsche is saying, we just need to be honest about the fact that we killed God. And there's a lot of work ahead of us. And this work includes justifying our existence, justifying this deed. Now that we've removed the thing that grounded us, that gave us a, um, a shared view of the world, a shared ethos, it gave us, um, it answered a lot of questions for us. Uh, created a lot of questions for us. And it's gone now. Um, and we don't perhaps know what's at stake in it being gone, but it's going to just be us drifting through the void alone. And we now need to become worthy of having done this. We have embraced our intellectual powers in part, not in full, so that we could undertake this great conquest of this old outmoded form of thinking and believing 
but what do, what do, we, what do, we, what do we do now, right? Now we have, to, we have to become worthy of having done this. We have to grow, right? And this is perhaps, this is perhaps most directly an admonition, um, an exhortation. Um, I mean, not, not just for the species, um, if that's possible, um, but for those, those select few creators to come along and give us new, new arguments, new visions of the world, um, new artists to, to come and create new values, things that can um, replace what it is that we've lost and not assume that there's just something out there um, waiting for us. Um, <clears throat> he's, he's, he writes here, at last he threw his lantern on the ground and broke into pieces and went out. I've come too early, he said, then my time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, it's still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars, and yet they have done it themselves. It has been related further on the same day. Uh, the madman forced his way into several churches, and there struck up his requiem eternum deo. Let out and called to account. He is said always to have replied nothing but, What after all are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God? And this is echoing there at the end some of that stuff that we saw in Emerson, um, in which, you know, religion had basically become the history of religion for a God that apparently used to be alive and really active, but you know, now we just. Um, the religious just commemorate um, the old ideas and the old revelations. Um, and Nietzsche here is sort of, you know, pushing this even further and just to say that, you know, that's what churches are. They're just tombs uh, where people go to commemorate um, a God who's no longer alive in society um, that only just perhaps exists in, you know, private thoughts and in, you know, uh, creedal recitations uh, that no longer have the power to affect, um, you know, any sort of meaningful collective action in, in the world. Um, he says here that he's come too early. You've probably heard similar language like this before, you know, like a sort of prophetic, like when the, when the prophet comes before their time, um, you know, people can't really hear what they're saying. Again, connection with Nietzsche when Nietzsche said the greatness, uh, you know, appeals to the future. Um, but he also here says something about this deed, um, that it both, that it's both happened and, uh, and that it's to come. And this means something like, for, 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 for those of you, again, we're, we're to get the Nietzschean argument here, right? Um, if you're still like, no, like God exists and, and I know it, right? Um, and so you're, you're, you're understandably, you know, uh, resistant to this, to this, uh, this view that Nietzsche's putting forward. Nietzsche is saying, this has already happened, and if you look around, and you take an honest stock of how you, and everyone you know, and everyone that you look up to, and how they actually live their lives, that at the most substantive and superficial level, it looks like everyone else in society. And that the few little like moral um, tweaks, you know, or, or pats on the back that you give yourself, that those things do not amount to anything significant. Um, and that the metaphysical stuff that you believe in, in no way seems to impact you on any sort of radical action that has you looking in any way different. You're still using the same big uh, banks and you're still paying your taxes and you're still like you know supporting all the same institutions and that the world goes round and everybody is now just a sort of you know functionary of the state in one way or another uh, particularly in a corporate sense um, and that when it comes to matters of knowledge you go to school and you learn how to textbooks and you trust historians and scientists usually right 
And, you know, further, he says here, you know, to, to, to finish that, that, that point, that last point, um, if you go out tonight and it's a clear enough night and you can see the stars, um, that happened a long time ago. Starlight is really old. And it is an event that took place perhaps millions of years ago. But it took all that time for it to reach you to actually experience what's already happened. And this is how the death of God is um, to people. That it's already happened. The world has changed around them, but it just hasn't reached them yet on some essential level. Um, but it will. And for Nietzsche, you know, it's just, it's, it's inevitable because it's happened. And so this isn't, this isn't a, strictly speaking, religious or theological statement, this is actually a sociological and historical, um, I, I will say proclamation, but also just an account that this is just what's going on in the world. Okay. Hopefully that gives you a lot to chew on. So let's, uh, let's look at, let's look at 290 really quickly. So, aphorism 290 of the Gay Science, on page 230 in our reader, says, One thing is needful, to give style to one's character, a great and rare art. It's practiced by those who survey all the strengths and weaknesses of their nature and then fit them into an artistic plan until every one of them appears as art and reason and even weaknesses delight the eye. So, the basic idea of this aphorism is, is... A lot of people think of like art projects as something maybe that they do when they're younger or on the side, you know, a little, uh, little crafting or something like that. Maybe, um, maybe experiment with writing some poetry or drawing a picture, right? So, but you put creative activity like over here, and then there's like living life over here on this other, you know, on this other side. And that what Nietzsche is saying that there's one thing that's needful in this in this life, and that is to Take your life as an art project, as, as an endeavor to have art um, master your life. And that is that it, it's changeable. You don't, it's not fixed. That you could start viewing your various proclivities and strengths, the various things that you're curious about, the various things that you are afraid of, that cause you anxiety, um, stuff that you just enjoy doing on some level that you just start to take all the different elements and aspects of your life and think of it as like raw material. And what he's going to go on here to say is that, you know, you'll find that um, some stuff is more easily changeable than other stuff. And so there's kind of like a primary and a secondary nature, which I, I think is more of a practical distinction than anything else. But, you know, th th there probably are some, some, some things that, that really can't be changed. However, that the stuff that it's really hard to change or that you can't change if you don't like it, he's going to say, just hide it. It's an art project. It's like, uh, think about think about a painting or a collage, right? If there's an area that you're working on and it's not working out, you just paint over it, right? Like maybe ignore it for a little bit. De-emphasize it. Um, try to put something else. Or surround it with things that then bring out the possibility of beauty there. Like even your weaknesses um, can become things that are your strength or that are beautiful within the context that you create for it. That you could just, if you just take a more creative approach with the um, the living of your life and the organizing of your life, and, it, and it's work. It requires taste. It requires experimentation. Um, it's not just you know resting on the way that things have been. Oh well, I've always been into this, or I've always done this, or I've never really liked this. Um, that you would have to start to become much more active in the living of your own life, and start making more artistic choices. And this means quite frankly, developing a sense of taste, which he goes on to talk about, you know, taste as um, being a refined sense of constraint. That it's not just, it's not just this idea of like, I like this, and so I just do it. And, you know, the more the better. That a lot of times what you have to do is you have to learn how to moderate, you have to learn how to say no, you have to learn how to say when is enough. You know, artists, you know, painting and knowing just just enough of, of one element of the painting of a, of, of a color or a shape or whatever it might be, um, you know, until something might become too heavy handed or gauche or just you know, whatever. Um, and so you have to you have to learn, 
you know, not to not to over season your life. Um, you have to learn. You have to learn balance, and you have to learn harmony, right? And so, like life, life is life is an art project. And if you look down at the bottom of this aphorism, he says, um, he says, for one thing is needful. This is like five lines up from the bottom of the aphorism. For one thing is needful that a human being should attain satisfaction with himself, with herself, with oneself. Whether it is by means of this or that poetry and art, only then is a human being <clears throat> at all tolerable to behold. Whoever is dissatisfied with himself is continually ready for revenge. And we others will be their victims, if only by having to endure their ugly side. For the sight of what is ugly makes one bad and gloomy. I mean, what he's saying is, is that for the people that don't do this, that on some level... Um, they're always going to be dissatisfied with themselves, that they haven't turned themselves into the person that they want to be. And because of that, because they haven't attained satisfaction, because they're dissatisfied, um, they take their revenge on other people. You know, if, if they are of a particular sort, perhaps this comes out in their judgments and their morality. Perhaps it even comes out in their kindnesses, right? But it could also very much come out through, um, you know, <laughs> not so healthily sublimated forms. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it just comes out as just pure aggression. Maybe it comes out um, in terms of hateful speech. Maybe it comes out in terms of just being a, a surly sob. You know, like there's just whatever it is, right? Um, in that, the best way to avoid uh, being a person with such a sort of terrible disposition is going to be to learn to attain satisfaction by undertaking your life in such a way as that there's nothing to be dissatisfied about because you've turned yourself into exactly uh, the type of person that you wanted to be in as much as it's within your power to do that. So it's a really, it's a, it's a really, really powerful um, aphorism that should, should get you thinking. Now let's look at uh, the last aphorism that I wanted to look at. And it is um, aphorism 341. It starts on page 236 and ends on page 237. And, you know, this, this aphorism touches upon um, Nietzsche's uh, idea of the eternal return, eternal recurrence, or eternal return of the same. Okay, aphorism 341. The greatest way. What if someday or night a demon were to steal after you until your loneliest loneliness and say to you, and so you, you really want to try to like imagine this if you want to like play along. Um, if you want to play along, try to try to visualize it, try to think how what feelings it really draws out of you, what thoughts it elicits from you. This life, as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more in innumerable times more, and there'll be nothing new in it. But every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you. All in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider and this moonlight between the trees and even this moment and I myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or, have you experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a God, and never have I heard anything more divine. If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you as you are, or perhaps crush you. The question in each and every thing, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more, would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight. Or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and sealing? So there's a couple of different ways to read this, this, um, this aphorism. And one is, in a let's call it an, an ontological or a metaphysical sense, um, and it is, it is something that I think we've already talked about, and that is that the best way to think about your life is part of this sort of cycle of, you know, 
the eternally returning you know, phenomenon of life are in this life-death death cycle in which you're just sort of, you know, a part of it. Um, and, you know, you could, you could maybe go even further with this in that we're talking like, you know, metaphysically, this idea of, of, of you being part of a universe that's just constantly, you know, um, I'll say revolving or, or it is everything that's happened is just happening again. And, and I'm sure that you've heard this idea before, maybe in a movie or maybe science fiction or horror or something. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we could do either of those readings perhaps a little bit more justice than, than, than what I'm going to give them, because what I think is most useful and, and perhaps the better reading um, for Nietzsche is that this is really a thought experiment. Uh, one whose abilities to be productive for us is our, you know, it is contingent upon our ability to imagine it and really think through it. And the idea is that we are presented here by this 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 demon, this you know, this force or whatever, that tells us that the life that we're living right now is a life that we have lived exactly like this, innumerable times in the past, and will live it innumerable times in the future, just like this. Your parents birth to you, all that stuff happened to you, all this stuff is happening to you, every conversation, every choice, everything, it's all the same, right? To infinity, right, backwards and forwards. You just keep repeating the same life, right? Um, now, what, <laughs> why? <laughs> what to do now? <clears throat> what he says is that either people are crushed by this idea, um, it's, it's too heavy, and they just, you know, life no longer has any meaning. They feel as though they have no agency. Um, and they're like, well, what's the point? Why go on living? None of my choices matter, if, if this is true, right? And I don't think that that's, those people don't properly apprehend just what's now become possible, what, how they've been challenged. The idea of the re eternal return of the same is just because you now become convinced that your life is eternally returning, again, as a thought project. But to take it seriously so that it works, if this is true, right, it doesn't mean that you suddenly know every choice that you're going to make in the future. You don't, you don't know what choices you've, you've made yet. You just know that you're living out this cycle in which everything that you've done just keeps happening. But now you know that whatever it is that you do choose is what you're always going to do. It's what you always have done and always will do. And so in some ways, this heaviest way, this thought, is the most liberating. Because now you have to ask yourself, what do I want for eternity? What is the will towards the eternal recurrence of my life and my decisions? How do I want to live? So I'm going to go grab a bag of chips and I'm going to like, you know, veg out uh, to some videos and, you know, just not really do anything. That's what I'm going to do, you know, for the next however many hours, right? Okay, that means for eternity, that's what you always do in that moment. That what it should provoke you to do, inspire you to do, is to basically start to approach life with this idea that eternity is at stake. Every time that you have an inclination to go do something really interesting, to do something a little daring, um, and you don't then you never do in all eternity. Every time that moment comes up, you, you back down. That this provokes us to be courageous, to take opportunities, to, to not defer things to, um, you know, down the line. That every moment is going to ring throughout eternity. And this is, this is liberation. Let's, if we just take it as this thought experiment, how do you want to live forever? If this were the life that you had to keep living forever, what do you want it to be? So don't get hung up on the idea that you somehow lose all agency because you're just living out the same life. Because again, you don't know the choices that you've made. And so now you can either be crushed by the idea or you can be set free to be the person that's in there, that's always been in there. And now the fear can be removed because what you have to gain isn't just that when you die, you die, and it's not that if you live a good life, you go to a nice place. You get to live out being the person that you want to be um, 
forever. It's a pretty powerful idea. Well, I hope you uh, got something out of it, that you enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to come back next week uh, with Simone Bay. Uh, until then, keep reading, keep thinking, and I'll see you soon.